Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to Leading Our Own Way. We're up to part three of this week's episode of the show. We're diving even deeper into our conversation with this week's guest. Let's continue exploring their inspiring journey. If you've missed part one and two, definitely go back and catch up. Also, if you're not subscribing, please, please subscribe. Enjoy the rest of the show. See you soon. You should not have to ask someone to treat you with respect. You should not have to tell someone that you've been raped for them to alter their behavior, right? And so no. the only thing I did and the only thing most of us do when we almost beg for respect using these vulnerable moments is we just give more ammunition to the person who's not respecting us. And later, most likely it will be used. And I know in my case, um, that information ended up being, you know, in a public display. I won't go into exactly the details of that, but that became public information. Um, to try to, you know, create um, a persona of who I was to defend this person's actions. Um, but, you know, again, just like everything else in life, I really learned from that, that, you know, when, I, when you are begging someone for respect, begging someone to treat you with dignity, that, that mistake is on you, right? If you should not be begging for respect, if someone is not giving you respect, you really need to turn inward, reflect on whether that's something that is in alignment with who you want to be, how you want to live your life, and then make choices that often include not having a relationship with that person any longer to regain your dignity and not ask them for it back because they're already not not respecting it. So again, just like everything else in my life, that was a really important lesson. And now I'm I'm so grateful because I think having those negative experiences has really led me to a point where I will not accept that in my life. I will protect my peace. I will model that for my children as well. And I think it keeps me so much more safe. It keeps me so much more focused. I have so much more energy to do important things when I'm not wasting energy trying to convince someone that I deserve, you know, just basic human level respect. And so I think when we stop wasting our energy in that way, again, that just puts us on a different path. And it's a path where we can really be successful and really lean into our future and, and just not worry so much about the road that they're trying to take us down. Yeah. I, I had like four or five, I had like four or five questions I was going to ask you then, but you just asked, you just answered them all. <laughs> So beautifully and what are what some what some valuable lessons for people to take away from all of those mm -hmm. points you've just made as well it's um beautifully said so when so coming out of the music industry then um what age were you and how did you how did you transition out of that and where did you go yeah so I had then become accepted into medical school. I had uh, moved back from – I had been living in New York City for years. I moved back to the Midwest um, after I had married and was just trying to figure out life. And I was getting my psychology degree in Indiana, and uh, it was suggested to me that I just go to medical school. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, well, yeah, right? You know, how hard can it be? <laughs> So well, that, I took my medical. Yeah. Sorry, that's right. Before, and I'm, I remember actually discussing about New York City because I absolutely love New York yeah. City. I've, I've been there many yeah. times. You were a young girl in New York City. That must have been mm. crazy because you wouldn't have been able to drink. But you, you went to the school of music, didn't you there? Yeah, I went to New York University and I was accepted into the school of music business. I had done an associate right. in their general studies program, which is like incredible and life changing because I can tell you for me, I'd been so focused on music up until that point in my life that I really didn't even consider myself to be an intelligent individual, which now from the perspective I have and from the things that I've achieved in my life, that boggles my mind, right? Another just... Yeah glimpse into my mind. mindset. Yeah. Well, just another glimpse into mindset and and how where you focus your energy is going to affect your decisions, right? So I didn't even necessarily want to go to college. I said, well, you know, parents, I'll go to college if it's in New York City. 
So I applied to NYU and I got in, um, which, you know, is crazy because I, I hadn't been preparing to go to college because I was like, I'm in the music industry. That's what I'm doing. Um, yeah. So I went to NYU and it was really, really transformative because I think for the first time I was really challenged in school. And I just remember going to my really small classes and reading books I'd never read before in my little Midwestern uh, school. And all the other kids in my classes that are young adults, they had already read these books because they'd gone to these East Coast prep schools, right? So they were bored, understandably. We've already read this. We've already wrote, written an essay on this. And I was so excited to be there because it was really the first time I was being really, really intellectually challenged outside of the music industry. And I just fell in love with learning and uh, got into the School of Music Business, which was also really exciting. But after I became engaged, um, it really was, it didn't align with my, my partner's feelings of safety with me being in the music industry. So then I moved, I changed everything and I moved back to the Midwest and started going to school there. Um, I started to study psychology and worked as a research instant, excuse me, as a research assistant and a teaching assistant for the psychology department and the Kinsey Institute, which is a really uh, interesting institution at IU Bloomington, and just really pivoted in my life and had been told at that point in time, no, you shouldn't be a therapist. You should be a psychiatrist. And as I said before, I was like, okay, I'll, why not? I'll apply to medical school. How hard could it be? <laughs> <laughs> oh my lord <laughs> again right how I could... I'll play nyu i'll apply to medical school <laughs> <laughs> i wish i'd done that now looking back what i again it's funny that you talk about mindset because my mindset now i i i i more worried about drinking and partying when i was in university i i, mm. I didn't you know I, I my mindset was completely off but you know i, I was young and whatnot but i don't know i know I went back to university here in australia and i aced everything i didn't think mm -hmm. twice about it but maybe i put it down to maturity but i don't think mm -hmm. i enjoyed learning at 28 i just wanted to get it done so i could start my career now mm -hmm. mindset maybe i did mature mm -hmm. later i know men's brains tend to mature around 27 28 but uh, at 38 i just fell in love with after writing the book i fell in love with learning as you can probably tell with some of the books behind me and yeah. um, now I can I visualize myself in like a neuroscience degree or PhD and I can just I can visualize myself taking everything in you mm. know even if I didn't do it as a career I'd just sit there and thoroughly enjoy it I, I, I don't I've gone off there but it was just because you said about mindset my mindset towards mm. learning is completely different and if I can embed that in my teaching and when I am with the kids it's not about them learning writing it's not about them learning math it's about them understanding the the brain to then switch it on to fall in love with learning if, yes, if that makes yeah. sense it's about the know. patterns, right? It's not about the subject. Yeah. It's about the pattern and yeah. the habit yeah. and loving learning, as you said. It that's that's when I started learning was when I actually was in an environment that made me love learning. And that's something that we don't, you know, so your environment, you know, was it your age or was it also potentially your environment? We're surrounded by so many distractions and so many expectations of how we should behave. And and those expectations are different at different ages too, right? It may have been expected yeah. that you needed to be in this role when you were in uni. Yeah. I, I think I was pretty left on the loose, I suppose, to make my own decisions. I don't, I never mm. felt, um, I don't know, never felt like a, I was, you know, you've got to do this by this time. You've got to have your career sorted. I never felt like that. I think, mm. I think sometimes I view that now, to be honest, like, because I turned my career, as you know, into a casual teacher so I could do this podcast and my learning. But I did that because I, I was tired of toxic environments. I was tired of, the burnout of industry because I couldn't do what I felt was right within it. Mm. As a casual teacher, I put the podcast to the side, put all of that aside. I actually get to teach. Um, I was in a school just on Friday where these kids were, it was the first time these kids could actually sit and listen, but they loved me talking about the brain. They said, even these boys turned around and said to me, Mr. White, carry on telling us about the brain. I f I'm finding it mm -hmm. fascinating. I think that's where we should be teaching them. I was talking about, yeah 
we were talking about blood sugar, we were talking about sugar, we were talking about food. They actually found it interesting. Hmm. And yes, you could bring in about the way it delivered, coming the passion for me. Absolutely, that all comes into play too. But we don't teach them this stuff. Imagine they could learn all of that. Writing and maths and all of that would come so much easily, easier to them. Mm -hmm. You know, and I could just see the the light light up. So I know the curriculum's all wrong. I know the system's all wrong. Um, but I'm the I'd be the wacko, the weirdo to come in and try and change it. You know. It, People don't want to be told how to parent. People don't want to be told, yeah. how dare you tell me that my children should eat, eat healthy food or eat vegetables and eat meat or whatnot. Um, they would turn around and, but I, my, my, my comeback to that would be, well, you don't complain how I teach them how to do a text, um, a, a, a sentence structure or a, a text structure or how I teach mm. them maths and the different methods into multiplication. You don't moan about that, but they would moan about me teaching them about no sugar in the food because we know how easy it is to to get the foods from the shops and, and, and whatnot. I know we've gone yeah. off there. I forgot my No, I've lost my no, I, I, I love it. Um, I think, yeah, we really lose a lot of opportunities to prepare young people for life when we only focus on, I think, you know, it's called the core curriculum here um, on the math and, you know, English and everything. And we're just really hyper focused on that. But life skills has really fallen to the side. Nutrition. I mean, even just when you look at what we feed our children in school, yeah. I mean, it might be meeting a certain metric, but I guess the good test would be, would we want to sit there and eat that every single day now as adults, or would we kind of turn up our noses and say, no, no, thank yeah. you. And okay, so what are we going to do about that? It's uncomfortable to change, but, but shall we do it anyways? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know um, we know the American diet is just like the UK diet. And um, I feel like it's getting here as well. You know, 73% of the, the foods in the shops have, have got products have got sh sugar in them, you know, and, and there's mm -hmm. 248 names for, for different names for sugar and, and things like that. I just, I just blows my mind that what well, I'm, uh, I don't know. We're going off. We're going off the subject here. But, uh, <laughs> that's okay. Where were we that's at? Okay. We well, I mean, it's health and wellness, right? It's that's health and yeah. wellness right there is is nutrition and sleep and oh. also not only just getting good nutrition, but also avoiding you know the uppers and the downers that are kind of built into our lives as socially acceptable yeah. and how those affect us. Um, so you know there are so many opportunities to either hinder our growth and development or help it by how we choose to interact with the possible foods and substances in our lives. Yeah. And I think that is the, the root. If we're going to the top of the chain, I do feel like that's the root cause of even unhappiness and depression mm -hmm. and people making poor decisions going into crime. If they actually would le learn, was taught, but then learned and reflected of how to actually feel good from sleep, from food, from contribution, through connection, through... Mm -hmm. And what your daughter's doing is giving to the world. They're going to grow up happy people. Crime will be reduced. Um, yeah. We'll have nicer people. We'll have people saying hi again in the streets, not ducking their heads because people can't have difficult conversations anymore. Nobody can look people in the eyes when they're walking down the street. That, you know, it blows my mind. It, you know, young yeah. adults would rather quit their job than go and have a difficult conversation with their boss. As Simon Sinek would say, I used yeah. I, I used to wondered what he meant, and then as I've the mm. years have gone on, and I'm I'm in the workplace, I'm seeing it. These young people are struggling. They they can't connect. Mm. They they struggle because of the way they were brought up and the foods right. that they were eating, and they're on devices till the point they're going to sleep, so they're not sleeping. Oh, yeah, but yeah. I got my eight hours. Yeah, but how deep of a sleep did you get? Yeah. And <laughs> we know? stigmatize them and we blame them, but we don't necessarily give any responsibility to the society and, and the people who, you know, yeah. maybe to their best intentions, s really set them on this path, right? And and we need to address all those issues if we don't want these habits to continue. If we want people to know how to deal with conflict, um, we, we yeah. have to teach them how to deal with conflict. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So can I, can I share a story with you? Something that happened two days ago. It's pretty funny. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, and it's right down that it's right down that topic. So uh, talk about teaching our children how to deal with conflict. Um, so 
<laughs> my daughter, my beautiful daughter. Um, I'll show, I've got a picture of her here. Let me see if you can see it. So she, you can't tell here, but she has a braid in her hair. This is when she was eight. She has just this beautiful long hair and she never wants to cut it. She's very emotionally attached to her hair, but she finally decided she wanted to get her hair cut. So a few days ago we had, you know, first, uh, appointment of the day, go get the haircut. You know, she was excited, nervous, uh, went there with her little brother. We were getting it all done, but he's four. So he needed to go outside and play. So we said, okay, we'll see you in a few minutes. We're going to go play outside in the grass. Um, so we went outside to play and then her brother had the most glorious nosebleed of his life. So we run back in. <laughs> We run back into the bathroom of the hairstylist. We check in with Sissy. Everything's fine. Um, and then we're, we're ready to head out. We all leave together happy, short hair. Life is great. And we see parked next to our car the city trolley that's only there in the summer months because we live in this big, lovely, touristy summer area. And so we see this old town trolley. The kids have never ridden it before. And so they just run. Mom, is it okay? Yes, it's okay. They run to the trolley, get on the trolley. There's another little family there. The kids automatically bond. They're all chitty chatting together. It's beautiful. Um, and I say, oh, you leave in a few minutes and it's going to be an hour ride. Do you mind if I go into my car and grab the water bottles for the kids? It's an hour and it's hot. And the driver looks at me like a deer in headlights. And he says, oh, that car right there? That's your car? Yeah, that's my car. Oh, we've been – oh, we need to talk to you. We've been looking for you. I'm, I'm so sorry. So the trolley, while we were doing all these things away from the car, the trolley had hit the car. <laughs> oh. Trying to avoid a car that was parked illegally in, in their space. They hit my car that was parked legally. Um, oh. But where it comes to, though, is so here's this, you know, somewhat – quite inconvenient <laughs> conflict yeah. that happened in this idyllic moment. And my kids were just so floored and enchanted by how it was managed. Yeah. Um, and I think, again, it's just showing how conflict can be managed properly. I know myself growing up, I would often see, not from my mom, but I would often see from other adults in my life, you know, kind of strong arming is, is the way you get what you want and show that you're really upset because that's how you're going to, you know, impress upon someone that what they did was really bad and they're going to make it right. And if you don't do that, then you don't show up strong, then you're weak. Um, and, and that's not my approach to life. And so, you know, we just sorted it out. Uh, the police were going to come. My kids were still on the trolley. So I said, well, can we ride the trolley with you while the police come and take the report? Do we need to be here? And I was like, because I, I, I wasn't here when it happened. I don't know what happened. <laughs> yeah. So they let us ride the trolley. So here we are with the driver who hit the car. And we're all on this hour long journey together. <laughs> And he's telling stories and interacting with the kids and we're all laughing. And really about halfway through, the kids even realized from the adults chatting, like what had happened to our car. And, you know, we, we come back, we get it all dealt with, everything's fine. And, and everyone was really nice about it. But I just tell the story because one, you know, how many people get hit by a trolley? That's pretty interesting. But two, my kids saw, okay, this accident happened. The adults weren't angry. They fixed it. And then they spent time together talking and getting to know each other more for an hour. And as small as that seems, they brought it up for days afterwards because to them, this was one of the first times that they'd seen conflict handled that way. Because even on the schoolyard, right, it gets really big, right? We have to get angry. We have to uh, start a fight with our friends and start this back and forth. And they saw a different way to handle conflict. And it's funny because am I happy the car got damaged? No. But mm -hmm. am I happy that I had this opportunity to model this for my kids? Yeah. yeah. Because how many times do we really have those opportunities, especially the older our kids get, for them to see us in real life deal yeah. with things in a proper adult way? So anyways, that was just something that happened in life that I thought was just kind of funny and, and a great opportunity to, like you said, just show people how we can deal with conflict and that it's okay to look someone in the eyes and say, hey, I'm sorry, I hit your car and then deal with as an adult and not run and hide, right? Yeah. But, it, you know, it, it goes deeper than that, doesn't it? For you in order to be modeling like that, you have to be secure and happy within yourself 
to a certain point at least in the way you get up yourself and set yourself up for the day every morning and and life uh, you know what i mean if you're getting up miserable every day the chances of you doing it the way mm. you did yeah probably would have gone the other way and <laughs> do you know what i mean am i right what do you think i think so anyway yeah i i think for me 10 years ago i i wouldn't have been upset but maybe i would have been avoidant yeah maybe um, yeah and now there was zero avoidance. There, not only was I not upset, I wasn't avoidant. It was just, yeah, this happened, yeah. you know. <laughs> mm, of course. And and let's let's be kind about it. And nobody meant to hurt anybody. Let's just deal with it, you know. That's right. Um, yeah. And 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 use this as an opportunity to model how we react in stressful situations to young people because hey, they're right here. So let's take it as an opportunity. So mm. yeah, I think I would have been maybe more avoidant about it um, than than I was now from this more healed, growth oriented place I'm in compared to ten years ago. Yeah, spot on. Yeah, yeah. All right, so back to your journey then. So you you're in medical school, um, and you're married. Um, where where does your journey, your life then lead um, after getting married and 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 practicing medicine? Yeah, so I think you know one thing for my journey was I was so dedicated and so busy as a medical student because again I did want to be in a very competitive field. Um, I mm. really wasn't home ever, you know, often on a rotation, yeah. you might get up at 2 a.m. because you've got to be scrubbed in at 4 a.m. Uh, for your, your surgical rotation, or you need to drive an hour to go to another place for another rotation. And then when you're home, wow. you're studying, right? So I was pretty much gone most of the time. And my partner also was, um, was studying. And so, so they were gone a lot of the time too. So in a way, I think that kind of allowed parallel lives. Uh, to go on for quite a long time. Uh, there were certainly problems, but they just, they, they weren't as big a part of my life because my life was so stretched thin by professional things. Um, but then, you know, once you complete your internship and your residency and you're out and you're working as an attending and the dust settles and you start to become a human again and have... <laughs> more recognition of the fact that you do have a little more free time, you do have a life. And instead of you having the autonomy to choose what to do with that, um, it's being kind of parceled off to things that are not for your goals and not for you. Um, and then, you know, for, for my journey, I was having less and less choice over how I spent my time um, to the degree that then I was no longer working clinically in medicine. I was only working for this person. Um, and I, I wasn't receiving a, a paycheck, you know, things were going into a retirement account, you know, so I didn't have access to funds and, and things were just happening to a point where I went from, you know, I moved to New York city by myself when I was 17 and lived on couches. Right. So I went from this hyper independent individual who'd been working since she was 14 to this person who now is a board certified physician, but doesn't have the ability or so I felt at the time to make my choices and to to work in the field I wanted to and to live my own life. And so once, because that process is so slow and insidious and the changes to the way you think that go along with those changes, it's it sneaks up on you. And because it's your life and it's day in, day out, and if you're surrounded by people who are really reinforcing that this is what your life should be, um, when that happens, you don't necessarily have the alarm bells going off uh, until someone else who's really supportive tells you. And I think another problem is when we're in these circumstances, we often become very isolated by design. Um, not only by the third party that benefits from us being isolated, but we, I think also isolate ourselves often because we may feel shame or embarrassment. We may want to hold up a facade. We may be forced to hold up a facade as to what our life is really like. Right. Um, mm -hmm. so once something shakes your soul and wakes you up and really challenges the way you're seeing your life and says, you know, what do you want? Like, let's, yes, there are all these excuses as to why your life is the way it is. Let's just put that aside. You know, we've acknowledged it. You've had your time to share. You feel heard. 
Now, what next? What do you want? And that is just such a pivotal moment. And that's a question that I had to grapple with. And once I really did the hard work of coming to understand what I wanted, both for myself, but also for my my children, then I had to do the hard work to make that happen. And that's not an immediate effect, right? That That's years usually to really change your mindset and change your lifestyle. But I was able to do that. And now I'm so grateful to me, the me that was back then that felt so disempowered um, and I had no agency. And yet I was able to make that one little step and then another and another and another toward the person that I could be and leave behind the person that I thought I should be. So you say you didn't really have choices in your life at that point in time. You know, I think we always have a choice, but I felt so disempowered at that time that I didn't see a way forward. I didn't see a way for change Hmm. until a different perspective was gifted to me. Before we go into that, what, what made you feel, what what actions made you feel that way? You know, I think when you're in a certain kind of relationship, uh, there's a lot of implied loss of agency. And then there are more rarely distinct statements where you understand uh, yeah. one, your place and two, what you are allowed and not allowed to do. Um, and in my reality, it, it was, it was a combination of both. There was a lot of implied and my life was really set up in such a way where I did not have privacy, um, of my, you know, everything from my social media and my email to even my, my home. There were other people living in my home, um, that were, you know, monitoring me. Uh, and that sounds really paranoid, but no, these were real human beings. <laughs> yeah, no. Can you give us? Um, so. Can you give us some examples of of how you were being monitored? Um, yeah, I was being reported on my daily activities uh, to my my partner at the time from from his family members. So because they they lived in my home, um, so you know, and I was sleeping alone um and and taking care of my kids but then I'd you know wake up and someone would be standing over me so even really at night when I was sleeping I couldn't feel that I could be alone and have that space respected and honored so um, hold on. so hold on. Yeah. hold on hold on hold on somebody stood at the end of your bed when you were asleep yeah, repeatedly, repeatedly. I mean, how close do they need to monitor you? You know, just the fact that you're in your room, the, the door shut should be enough, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, well, yeah. Okay, so you woke up, you wake up on these occasions. What does that conversation look like in the moment? Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.